the number one thing that you need to keep in mind when you're on LinkedIn is you cannot sell to people until they believe that they have the problem that you solve. Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremy from the Quick Mail Tayo. Hey, and this is Jack from Emails That Sell. Dot com. Today, interview. Hey, Jack, just before we start, I've been doing some thinking lately. You know, a podcast won't be legit until we have a sponsor, right? Okay, but haven't we been turning down sponsors? I know, but it's hard to recommend something you and I don't use often, and we're already promoting the crap out of our services. Fair point, but what about the course we just released? Wouldn't you recommend that to our listeners? Yeah, for sure I would. All right, so how would we start? Well, for starters, I wouldn't mention that it took us over a year and three trips to Japan and Switzerland to record the thing. All right, all right let's not do that. But at minimum, I would want to mention where they can find the course. Like, let's put it to, I don't know, course.quickmail.io. Would that work for you? It works. And then I could share what a few of those early students had to say about it. Like the one from Damien, who said it was by far the best course on cold outbound I've ever taken. Or what did Chris say? The week on sales research and targeting prospects blew my mind. Yeah, we definitely want that in there. Yeah, I like it. It's kind of too easy. You know, people always say nice things when they get results. And at some point, we're going to have to come up with some hard sales copywriting materials of our own. And you know, I'm not that great at that. So I don't know, what would you put on a page? Okay, how about this? Imagine that instead of getting ignored by prospects day after day, you could just follow a course that shows you how to book meetings with dream clients and automate the entire outbound process so you can focus on closing deals and scaling your company. Plus, there's that money-back guarantee and the eight modules and the bonus podcast interviews. But so far, so good? Yeah, I like it, man. But you know, I like your style. So anyway, all right, it's getting a bit late. So can we podcast now and review that later? Yeah, but at least promise me that course.quickmail.io is finally live and people can finally try out the course right now. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. I already put it live. And just so you know, I added that special price we discussed about for our podcast listener. And then we can leave it here until, you know, we're happy with the landing page. Sounds fair enough? Yeah, let's do it. All right, guys. Very exciting podcast episode today. We're bringing the go-to LinkedIn expert, in my opinion, on the face of the planet here. Nathaniel Bibby is going to school us on how to use LinkedIn to really generate B2B leads and start conversations with the right buyers. And Nathaniel is a trainer, speaker. He's a marketer, an entrepreneur. He works with tens of thousands of brands like Apple. And uh, he basically teaches people how to do well with the platform. And he certainly succeeded himself. He won best use of LinkedIn in 2019 without spending a dime on advertising. So, <laughs> rock and roll, Nathaniel, thanks for joining. No, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You bet. So, all right, what do we need to know about this mythical platform here? I mean, should every sales rep be on it? And if so, what's sort of the edge? Well, uh, certainly if you're in business to business, I mean, the old days, you used to pick up the telephone and you get the, we call it the yellow pages down here. I don't know if you have it in the US, but um, we start telephoning it. And these days, that's statistically effective 1% of the time. You make 100 phone calls, you could book one appointment. Whereas, you know, these guys are on LinkedIn. It's just about approaching them the right way. So if you're in sales or you're looking to, you know, build relationships in business, it's a very effective tool if you know how to use it properly. Okay, so it's really for anybody whose customers happen to be in the B2B realm, maybe. Yeah, it also works extremely well for people in finance, any professional services. I honestly think it can work in B2C as well. Like if you're a hairdresser, there's no reason why you can't target high net worth individuals in LA if you're in LA, for example. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So let's maybe exclude one small group. Let's say if we're selling B2C, and that includes hairdressers that may not be going after, let's say, high net worth individuals, maybe they can take a pause from this cast. But everybody else who is selling to professionals can pick up some tips here. Absolutely. One thing I'd like to say is at some point you mentioned the right way of approaching. Yep. Can you start by telling us what's not the right way, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, so social media is a relatively new form of, of marketing, right? We haven't really had a form of marketing where 
it's social before. And so it's a little bit like going to a cocktail party, really. So you can't walk in and just start saying, hey, here I am, buy my shit. <laughs> um, are we allowed to swear on this podcast? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> For you, you can say whatever you want, man. <laughs> you can bleep it out. <laughs> but um, who's going to talk to somebody who's just, you know, it's all about themselves, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. And so the wrong way to do it is to approach people thinking what's in it for me instead of what's in it for the other person. And, you know, you've got to have your profile looking good. Like everyone's going to look at your profile. People don't realize, you know, it's not like when you pick up the telephone and, you know, when you're cold calling, you tell people who you are and why you're calling. But on LinkedIn, you don't have to do either of those things because they can click on your name and read your profile. Now, if your profile looks like a resume, yeah, right. I always say to people, is it? When I do my talks, I say, has anybody in the audience ever bought anything because somebody handed them their CV? That's a good one. <laughs> I love that. And everybody goes quiet. <laughs> so how do we fix it? Like, uh, yeah. how do I fix my LinkedIn profile here? Help me out. So it starts with having the customer in mind. So you've got to be thinking about what, what's the problem that you solve. The number one thing that you need to keep in mind when you're on LinkedIn is you cannot sell to people until they believe that they have the problem that you solve. Okay. Boom. So soundbite. <laughs> Let's do a snippet. I love that, Nathaniel. And so like I say, believe that they have the problem because you might know that they have the problem, but until you hear them say it, you can't start selling to them because they don't recognize it yet. And so it's about like asking questions to find out from them, you know, if they do have the problem that you solve so that you can offer the solution until then, no selling. <laughs> okay. So maybe help me out. Um, let's say I'm doing lead generation for a particular kind of company. Now, I'm not quite sure I understand how I can help them believe they have this problem. Sure. What kind of things can I do or communicate on my profile? Well, I mean, um, like if you know specifically who your audience is, I think about it like I'm going to the doctor, right? Like if I've got, you know, if you're a doctor that uh, treats people that have a cold, for example, <laughs> you know, then you're looking for people with colds. And so you say, do you feel like this? Do you have these symptoms? You know, and if you do, these are the way that I've helped people in the past. This is how you can get in touch with me. This is the next step. So for my business, for example, you know, I might say, have you found that traditional marketing methods are no longer effective? And, you know, you may not know what your return on investment is with your marketing. I help businesses get more customers through the world's largest professional network, LinkedIn. And, you know, this is how you can get in touch with me. So it's about thinking about what's the customers or the target audiences already got in their mind. Because if they knew what the solution was, the chances are they would have solved the problem. <laughs> yeah. So one of my favorite copywriting books of all time, it's... Um talking about how you enter the conversation by speaking their language. You know, if there's a, if a group of people uh, are standing outside and it's raining and they've got their umbrellas on and you jump in and say, hey, I'd like to sell you used cars, it's not going to work. They're going to turn you down. But instead, if, if you sort of jump in there and you're also soaking wet and you're standing in a puddle and you say, you know, some weather, huh? And it's just a way to get the conversation going so that People know you can relate to them and you're, you're sort of resonating with some of the problems they're dealing with, right? That's, yeah, that's right, yeah. And it's about finding out who you don't want to sell, you don't want to do business with as well, you know, mm. very quickly. If, somebody, if you're a doctor and somebody healthy walks in, you want to find out really quickly so you can get onto the sick people. Yeah. You know, so you're right. I think like you can waste a lot of time selling to people that don't have the problem. And also um, you devalue your service as well because if you're sending the message out there that you'll deal with anyone and everyone, then you come across as, as needy and people don't want to do business with needy people. It's a bit mm -hmm. like picking up chicks. <laughs> uh, I've been married too long. I don't know about that, but <laughs> I'll be too. <laughs> Fair enough. So, okay. And stupid question, but this goes in the like uh, about section or s experience. Where do we put this nice little blurb here? Yeah. In the about section is a good place to start. And the headline's, you know, quite important. So most people have their job title in their headline. And you can use it to be a bit more descriptive than that and say, you know, we help B2B companies, you know, grow their business or you can put your job title, but try and put some keywords in there as well. And then your profile picture is really important. Like if you want to have a professional photograph, that's where the eye goes first, you know. Like my advice is try and do something a little bit different than what everyone else is doing. Like if you're a real estate agent, you know, if you've got the suit and tie on and in front of the white wall like everybody else, you're not really going to stand out. Yeah. So maybe go outside and, 
I don't know, put a t-shirt, pink t-shirt on or something. <laughs> okay, Jeremy, I'm hopefully not stealing this question from you, but I know we've we've actually talked about this on the cast a couple of times. But uh, one of the ways we like to try and build social proof is by positioning ourselves as an authority figure, and one can do that if you have a lab coat and you're a doctor. Okay, that's authoritative. Or if you're a keynote speaker such as yourself, maybe you want to use a, a podium shot. Any f- feedback on what kind of photo will help us? Establish credibility. And I'd like to say that for our audience, that Nathaniel LinkedIn profile is showing him, you know, in front of um, a tag wall kind of thing. I mean, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> can you describe yeah. maybe, you know, your picture and why you choose this one at the same time? Yeah, sure. The photograph I have is me kneeling down. You can see my white sneakers there and so on. And I'm look, literally just thinking about standing out from the crowd, doing something a little bit different and fun. Um, and then in the background image, which is the banner, like that's a good place to put that credibility stuff, like a picture of you speaking, uh, if you've got one, nice. or maybe, you know, some certificates. I used to dress very professionally and I do if I go to certain meetings, but when I speak from stage, what I've found is when I go to events, most business people are wearing suits and shirts and stuff. So to stand out, I rock up in a t-shirt and sneakers. <laughs> it's to do with my branding. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, maybe you should try the lab coats then. Maybe that would work. <laughs> Who knows? No, but it, it's about branding, right? Like your brand, Nathaniel, would never do the lab coat. It's more like of a human to human, let's help do business. Like it's it's kind of, a, you know, you're big into storytelling and, and sort of opening up with your yeah. audience. So maybe your photo should reflect that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's funny because I, I don't feel comfortable doing it in a business meeting. I would, I'll, I'll walk into a business meeting wearing a shirt, but when I'm speaking from stage, I like to be relatable. I find them, you know, most of the audience is not dressed up and the speakers are, so it's like the disconnect. Fair enough. So is that fair to say that your profile picture on LinkedIn should be approachable, like showing someone who is approachable? Like, yeah. And then the banner behind it show the sort of like more professional person? Is that some strategy we could use, some tactics? Like what you were saying before, social proof is really the thing that I'm getting at with the banner. Or if you don't have something like that, then familiarity works quite well. So if you are living in LA and your target audience is in LA, nice. if you put an aerial shot of LA, it's something that's familiar to them. So therefore, they're going to feel more relaxed. Man, that's amazing. Thanks for the tactical stuff. We, our listeners love this. You can actually go home and do it tonight. So along that theme, I want to ask you, super quick backstory, hired a marketing consultant, and basically my golden question that I was paying to get an answer for was, hey, pretend you're my doctor. I want you to write me a prescription for how I can get the word out on XYZ channel. Like, What's my daily dose of, in your case, Nathaniel, LinkedIn? You know, like, yep. Prescribe me a set of activities that'll make a real difference here. Sure. So this is what I love about LinkedIn is because on the, you go on Instagram or, or some of the other channels, you can't really decide who's in your audience. Like people who follow you, follow you, you can advertise, whatever. But on LinkedIn, you can choose. It's like, well, if I want to target lawyers that live in Florida, I can you know, isolate them all, start connecting with them, and then they, they actually start seeing my content. They, LinkedIn actually puts your content in front of your new connections because they knew, you know, they've just connected with you and it's more relevant. And so... First thing is just consistently be growing your network with a target audience, with a niche, not with everyone. Um, that's a big mistake is to, to do it with everyone. Um, okay. Focus on a niche. So like most people, because most people log in, right? And they go, oh, what do I do on LinkedIn? And so they say, oh, look, I've got 10 connection requests. And so they accept, maybe they reject some, but they're being reactive. They're not being proactive, you know? And so they end up, like even if they end up with 20,000 connections, if they were being reactive, they're going to be salespeople and recruiters. Like that's, <laughs> they're like, oh, LinkedIn's full of salespeople. I'm like, no shit. What, you know, you just accepted connection requests. Who do you think is going to send them to you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so true. Um, okay. So let's be, let's say intentional with our network growth, but yeah. a couple questions on these. Help us out with this sort of connection message, maybe if you've seen yeah. stuff that's working. And also, oh, yeah. do I need to be afraid of LinkedIn's limitations? I once saw that there's a 3,000 person or invite cap. Is this complete garbage that I saw on the internet? Or I don't know if it's 3,000. I know there is a limit. And so you can, if you go into the network tab, I'm trying to remember where it is, and you can look at your sent mess, uh, invitations, 
you can scroll back a little bit and withdraw some. So okay. like when we're running campaigns for clients, we always withdraw, you know, ones that were sent over a month ago or so. Cool. Um, so that never been an issue. But I have been uh, restricted by LinkedIn about six times. I'll have, you no, know. No, <laughs> six times. I'm only yeah. one. I'm such a rookie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to know where the boundaries are. So it's funny because I've been restricted six times, but I've never had a client restricted. So okay, it's like I'm taking all the risks. Yeah, you want to red line and let everybody else be in the safe zone, right? Yeah, but at the start, I was making all the mistakes. You know, I was just pressing connect, connect, connect. And now we send a customized connection request. And to answer your question, it'll say something a lot like, Hi, Mark, I've noticed your profile generally focus on second degree connections. So they know the same people you know. I mean, the chances are of them connecting with you. If they've got, if they see like you've got 300 lawyers in Florida that are also mutual connections and they're a lawyer in Florida, like there's a big chance that they'll say yes. Um, so you just say, look, thank you for connecting. Notice we've connected to a lot of the same people, interested in finding out more about what you do. I'd like to invite you to join my network. Simple. But you've customized it. So first of all, you stand out from the other 20 and uh, you've shown interest in them. And then they're going to feel like, well, you know, we know the same people. It's, I don't want to be rude. Let's connect. And then psychologically, they've just given you permission to contact them down the track because they're now, they're a connection now, now you know. Cool. I love that. <laughs> well, I'm going to play a little bit uh, devil advocate. You know, in terms of lawyers, they're always like looking for clients, but there are some industry where they are actually not looking for clients on LinkedIn. So approaching to them, just telling them like, hey, should we just connect? May actually not be as appealing. Everybody loves talking about themselves. If you show interest in them, it'll work. Yeah. 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 Every single person. <laughs> I've never met one that doesn't. <laughs> Fair enough. So, question because, uh, Nathaniel, the way you and I started talking, I asked sort of a, a call to action in this connection invite. And I believe it was something like, hey, some of our listeners have been talking about you, said you'd be like an awesome guest to have on the show. Oh, cool. Would you be up for another interview? And I'm just curious to find out if you're a fan of asking or let's say opening the conversation directly as opposed to saying, hey, would you be up to connect? Sort of something passive that all they have to do is accept. Or if you just want to go straight to the conversation starter, hey, do you mind telling me a bit what you're working on right now? You know, make it all about the prospect here. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I prefer to connect with them first. Um, okay, interesting. But um, if you've got the profile to back it up, like if you've got the credibility there and you're confident, then you can do it. It'll save time. But like, the reason I don't like it is because um, you can't just hit reply. Like if you press accept, it disappears and it's like, oh, where's it gone? Now I can't reply. I've got to go find it in my inbox. So that makes it more difficult. But, you know, I mean, inviting someone to be on a podcast is quite an ease, like it's quite a value add, you know? That's right. Low commitment as well in terms of what I'm asking from you. It's more a give, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if like you wanted me to um, sell me, um, you know, a tailored suit. Life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you connect with them first, but then only one message after that. Like, thank you for connecting. I've noticed that, um, you know, there's some similarities between what you do and the clients I work with. I'm interested in uh, finding out more about what you're up to, your business objectives, whatever it may be, Okay. Um, to see if, if I can help, you know? Nathaniel, that's really helpful. I'm obviously on a personally interesting topic here. So uh, two more questions for me. Yeah. One, I think it would be really helpful to have like a little notification saying, you know, Jing, new prospect, just accept a connection request because I know that they're on the platform right now. Maybe they're using it on their iPhone and oh, yeah. that would be prime time to reach out with like a really quick question to find out more about what's going on. Are there any tools that help us stay on top of instant connection acceptance, I suppose? What's out there? Oh, look, just the notifications, I guess. Like if you, you know, on LinkedIn, yeah. on your mobile, that would be the best way to do it. In terms of like any automation tools and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Like I stay away from them. I've like, I've, I'm, I'm aware of what's... You tried it five times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you recall a conversation. <laughs> okay, cool. So like, I know a bit about what's out there. Like I know that most of them are, um, what do they call them? Macros? that um, learn patterns and then they, they repeat behavior. Like it's just, I mean, the way I'm positioned with my, my um, client base, they're mostly corporates and like I, if they, they're very fragile with their brand. Like I wouldn't get too upset about it if something mistake happened, but with them, it really doesn't, um, it's not a good look. So I, I just think that it's so important for us to 
avoid anything happening, that we do everything manually. It's systemized, so I delegate it. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot more time and, and um, a cost involved at, from a business perspective to do it that way. Yeah. But, but no mistakes happen. Yeah. Fair enough. Nathaniel, I'm curious. First one is, do you actually see a diminishing return right now with this type of, you know, connecting and then sending an email just after? Like, you know, it it starts to to spread and then people are becoming like more annoyed by this thing. And the second follow-up question is, have you experimented with actually the voice connection or the voice messages once you're connected? Yeah, uh, look, I use uh, voice messages when I know somebody. Like it's, I think that, um, you know, for somebody to listen to a voice message, you've got to give them a reason. Otherwise, you know, you're taking their time. I, I don't know if it would be as effective. I haven't experimented with it. In terms of like people getting annoyed, yeah, absolutely. Like, like it's just like email, right? We're getting more and more messages on LinkedIn. Important thing to do though is if you like build your network, so you've, you're the one that's got like all those connections in common and if you post content like and you're building your brand, like then you're, you know, there's a different ball game. But when you're starting out with 100 connections, for sure, it's getting harder just to, to, to get started, which means, you know, it's just more important to get the ball rolling now and build your network as fast as you can, but with the, with the right people. Like, it's, it, it would actually be a lot easier for me to get sales on LinkedIn if I'd done that from the start. If I had, like, if I had 10,000 followers that were all, you know, the ideal target market, it'd be a lot more valuable to me than the 35,000 followers. Okay that are, you know, most of them are targeted, but there is a lot that I've just hit except, except, except. Yeah, why? Because um, sure, it's a little broader, but if it's like maybe more people seeing your posts and sharing, how is it more effective with a smaller yet more defined? Because of the engagement rate. So like it, from a, the algorithm's perspective, it, it's looking at the percentage of people that engage with your content. Wow. Ah. And so the more relevant they are, like if they're all lawyers and you're like posting about, you know, marketing for the legal firms all the time, you're going to get huge engagement rates and more lawyers are going to see the content. So it's really powerful. So would you ever recommend trimming down this list we have, this network? Yeah. I mean, like, if you still have a small network, like if you've got left, because you only have 30,000 connections, I, I say only, but like, you know, yeah. if you've still got a, like a low amount, I would focus on growing, not trimming, because it's, it's better to add prospects than to be focusing on, you know, what not to do. But for me, like I'm always trimming, like I'm, I'm always trimming because I want to add new wow. connections who I can only add 30,000. Mm-hmm. So I'm always, you know, removing a couple hundred so I can add some people that I meet and stuff. Well, don't remove me and I'll be fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> you need to still add me. <laughs> yeah, well, it's difficult because you've got to use the search feature to try and isolate people that aren't relevant. It's like I'm searching for people that are like the opposite of, of what I was searching for before, which was leads. Now I'm looking for the opposite. There you go. <laughs> Nathaniel, like a few years ago, I actually focused on the financial planner market in Australia. Perfect. Hard not to crack for sure. But exactly, you know, following those tactics, inviting people, it becomes easier and easier because, you know, everyone started to be in my network. Nowadays, not sure if that's going to be censored or not, but I don't give much thoughts, let's say, let's say polite. I don't give much thoughts to the financial planner, you know, market industry now, but I've probably got like 300 of those. Should I just like trim them down then? Because they're on market, I'm not interested anymore. How many connections do you have? I don't know, probably 3K or something like that. It's okay. It's, it's good to have them because the reason why it's good to have them is because they will be connected to people that you could probably do business with, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Good point. So like, um, yeah. I'm the king of interrupting guests. I, I'm like no, interrupting is good. Like <laughs> Gary V taught us that. I don't know if you guys follow Gary V, but he's sure. <laughs> he's always interrupting people. Seth Godin <laughs> has some thoughts on interruption uh, as well, but uh, I'm certainly not at uh, yeah. That level. So, anyways, I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, um, question: Okay, our listeners are are hearing that it's a good idea to grow our network so that we can reach more of our target audience. What kind of limits would you recommend for a beginner to LinkedIn? connections. Um, how many a day can I send, for example? So at the start, like you want to start off small. So it might be like 30 or 40. And then once you get in your groove, then you can get up to about 100. If you upgrade to Sales Navigator, they're not really going to keep tabs on you as much because cool. you know, you, they know that you're, you're prospecting. You're paying. <laughs> but the, only reason, the only reason they're keeping tabs on you is so you upgrade, really. Yeah. You know, so this is the thing, right? I saw the business plan for LinkedIn's second round of capital raising. And it said, we're a recruitment site. People submit their CVs and recruiters will use the site to find talent. 
And then like a couple of years later, they're like, oh my God, all these salespeople and marketers are using it. What product are we going to sell them? You know, so they come up with this product. Like they didn't anticipate the market at all. So the sales navigator thing, like it's taken a long time for it to be worthwhile because, you know, they were selling emails. You send messages to people you don't know, which have a 2% conversion rate when you can connect with them and, and for free and, and you get a 15 to 30% conversion. Okay. So am I hearing a bell go off that emails are not where you focus a lot of your team's time and instead it's about this network? Yeah. Yeah. Wicked. Okay. Yeah, it's about building relationships. It's not about spamming people on LinkedIn. Okay. Do you have experience with transitioning from this conversation from LinkedIn to another platform? And for us, especially, it's interesting to, you know, uh, go to email specifically. Do you have experience from taking one of your prospects from LinkedIn to another medium? Yeah, I always, I mean, I like prefer to take them to the telephone straight away. But because um, mm. like if, if email look, is fine if you, you know, booking an appointment or, you know, sending a calendar invite. But if you're, if you're getting their email address to then market to them, you're going from a high converting platform to a lower converting platform. So it just depends what the purpose is, really. Like always try to take the conversation straight offline, like onto the phone. I think it's the best way to do it. You just look at it from like a time perspective. It's going to save everyone time. Love it. How do you do that? How do you say like, okay, let's jump on a call? What's your phone? Yeah, well, you just you just did it. <laughs> For the same I'm as overthinking it. I'm Come on, you do it naturally. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so basically, someone connects with you. Like, take me through, if you don't mind, a classic yeah. connection request, acceptance, and then something happens, and then the call. Like, what does that look? Like? Yeah, sure. Okay, no worries. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, I, thought I just told you the connection request. Basically, like, I'm interested in connecting with you because I'm interested in your profile. We have got some mutual connections. Blah, 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 regards to Nathaniel. Oh, you just connected. So thank you for connecting. I've read through your profile and I can see that you're in X industry, which, you know, is very similar to some of the clients that I've worked with. I'm curious to find out more about what your growth objectives are for this year. Are you up for uh, spending some time on the telephone? And if so, what's the best number to reach you on? And then that's it. And so obviously... Single message. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Straight for the kill. I mean, I've got feedback from other LinkedIn marketers around the world that do drip campaigns. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we get between, we've increased our conversion rates from 10 to 15%. So like, I mean, I'm getting minimum 15% conversion rate with one message. So I don't see the point. But like you had mentioned earlier, they're going to check out your profile. So it has to look great. So it could be that since you're Nathaniel Bibby, of course, people are going to maybe have a little bit more eagerness, right? We run campaigns for um, clients in every, like all sorts of industries at every different level. So that when I suggest these things, it's based on like all of the clients that I've worked with on their campaigns, not on what I do. I actually don't do this strategy anymore at all. Like I, I just do content. Okay. Yeah, get inbound leads. So um, do you actually so, start by redefining the profile before you actually start working with someone? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's the first step. With, with whatever you do, they're always going to look at your profile. And that's why we're not, the messages aren't starting with, hey, I'm Nathaniel, but I'm the managing director of Bibi Consulting Group. I do LinkedIn marketing. Right. I don't say any, you don't say any of that shit because we want them, like they're, they're going to be like, who the fuck, who's this guy? Yeah. And, and so they'll yeah. click on your name. But when they click, They've asked for the information. So they're actually more receptive to reading it rather than you just pushing it on them. Yep. That's brilliant. Okay. So wondering if, let's say, this would work for, let's say, the hardest industry to crack, maybe life insurance. I mean, is it a bit transparent when we reach out to, let's say, a doctor and we're, they know our title says life insurance and we message them after they connect and say, hey, you know, I happen to serve other doctors in Florida. Does it make sense to talk a bit about your life insurance? Does that ever break down in certain industries? Um, that's almost there. Like That would kind of work. The step that would make the big difference would be if the headline says said exactly the same thing. Because if you, if you think about it, like there's going to be things in the medical industry that there's going to be certain things which are, are specific to that industry. And if you're a specialist, in life insurance for those kind of people and you've got the mutual connections who are also other you know doctors that maybe you, if, even if you go as far as got some testimonials if you just stand out it's like well maybe there's no harm in speaking to this guy you know maybe you know i'm missing out on something here and that's the key like if you get if you can give the prospect fomo <laughs> you're 
you're winning. Nicely said. One thing I'd like to know, Nathaniel, is do you have any tips or advice for how to do the targeting properly? Yeah. Like, you know, making sure you contact those people. You gave a good example with the lawyer, you know, in Los Angeles and so on. But let's say I'm B2B in a certain space and so on. Is there some tactics or some advice you could give people for how to do targeting properly on LinkedIn? Yeah, great question. Great question. It's really important. And so there's a search bar at the top and that will crawl the entire profile for keywords. You know, and it's, it'll, the way the search results go, yeah, they'll show you the first degree connections first, then the second degree, et cetera. So yep. if you go into the advanced search feature, which is basically gives you the specific criteria, then you can isolate second degree connections only. And then you can put the title of the position of the person you're targeting, whether it's CEO or CFO or, you know, whatever it may be. And then it will find those keywords in that specific area of the profile. And then I would go also look at industry. Like if you're targeting like the marketing industry, marketing would pick marketing and advertising and then location as well. Pick the city that you're in. And then that way you've got quite a targeted list. And if you do the search results and let's say there's 20,000 people, then you can think, okay, what keywords could I put in the search bar as well to make it even more targeted um, and narrow it down further? But um, most people, you know, like you, if you're just starting, like you probably won't get that many people. And, and if you've only got like 50 people show up, you know, logically people think, oh, well, what am I going to do after the 50 people, right? I'm going to run out of people. But what happens is once those people accept your connection request, ah. you do the same search, you get more people show up because you've got more connections in common with that industry. Yeah. That makes sense. Do you change your strategy if you have access to LinkedIn Navigator? Yeah, Sales Navigator is really good for targeting like businesses of a certain size. So like the number of employees within an organization is a feature you can use on Sales Navigator. Um, other than that, there's not too much like that I delve into. Like that whole seniority level and stuff like that. I don't know if it's how accurate it is. I don't really use it. Makes sense. I'm agreeing with you right there. Okay, so Nathaniel, let's take it back a, a couple of questions ago. Prescribe me the LinkedIn marketing growth plan, right? Like, and we started off talking about how important it was to grow a targeted network. So that may be phase one. But eventually, we're going to turn to organic content. And I'd love to hear... Sort of your take on this because arguably there's nobody else who gets this concept better than you do. And I, and I mean that not as really to flatter, but really just as a matter of fact. So help our listeners out. Like, how do we do LinkedIn content? First of all, thank you. That's very kind of you. Look, I think, you know, taking those conversations offline as well is quite an important topic because if you are a small business or a startup, like I think you should be making return on investment from day one by setting appointments. And so you've got that working, then you spend the other half of your time building your brand, which is more of a longer term play. If you're so desperate for leads that your content needs to bring in business, it's not going to work that well because you need to be adding value consistently. You know, Gary Vee talks about jab, 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 right hook. Yep. And I think if he redid that book today, it would be jab, 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 jab. Maybe not even the right hook at all. I don't know. But it's you're like, you've got to just add a lot of value and it's a longer term thing, you know. And, um, and so like if you're posting content and you're not getting response, it's going to be tempting like to do some hacks, right? Join in like an engagement group or something like that. And I really encourage people to stick at it and just think about it like you're building a relationship with prospects. You need to find out like from them what's going to be valuable, you know, to them. Because if the value that you're providing, like, to get engagement, to get likes and comments is not um, for your audience, if it's for, for some other reason why people are engaging with your content, then it's not going to lead to sales. It's not going to lead to business relationships. Because you could have 30,000 followers on LinkedIn and you could get 500 likes every post and you could not be able to pay your rent very easily, very easily. It's a trap that you want to avoid. Whereas if you have 30,000 people who are expecting your content, like your content, they trust your content, and you actually build offline business relationships with them, you are the industry authority. There's no negotiation on price. So you can choose who you do business with. It takes a while. Like for me, it took a couple of years. A couple of years of posting content, all my friends are going, what are you doing those stupid videos for? You know, well, and I didn't really have an answer. It's not like I could say, well, look at me, I'm rich. I just kept doing it. 
And then all of a sudden it was like, hang on, where's all the, where, where is everyone? Where's the competition? What, you know, and, and there's different levels. First of all, the big brands contact you, then international companies will contact you. And, you know, everyone else contacts you as well, but you can just be quite selective with who you work with. So maybe this is a, a longer term play here where you're doing the, the short term wins, which would be connecting with people and taking them offline onto the phone. That's the short term, you know, let's pay the bills. And then meanwhile, you've got this content thing rolling. And by the way, like the content will help with the short term thing as well. It's just that you can't, you've got to be doing it. Like, so I think most people who joined LinkedIn in the last couple of years, because they didn't never had experience, like in the old days, you couldn't post content on LinkedIn. You just couldn't. There was only 200 people that could do it. Tony Robbins, Richard Branson, guys like this. So yeah. So most people, like they're on it and, they're, and they're, they are hungry. They're really hungry for business. And they're like, hmm, what should I post? You know, instead of actually going direct to the target market and booking an appointment to make a sale. And if you're somewhat like a little bit uncomfortable approaching people you don't know or a little bit uncomfortable selling, it's very easy to use the keyboard as like a way to procrastinate or to hide from speaking to customers. Like if, unless it's adding, you should be doing more appointments if you're active on LinkedIn not spending more time on LinkedIn and less appointments, unless it's adding value to your offline relationships, then it's a waste of time. You probably should not be on there at all and focus on, you know, like it's really important that, you, that you're uh, taking conversations offline and you're building real relationships with people. If Seth Godin talks about this perfectly. He's like, you might have 10,000 Facebook followers, but I've got 300 people I could call up and I could stay on the yeah, couch if I needed to. That's a nice one. What, what's more valuable? So let's say it's, I'm a busy salesperson. What can I concretely do that doesn't necessarily take a lot of my time, but still provide a lot of value in terms of, you know, LinkedIn posting? You know, there's always this balance between time and value, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a n- number of ways to do it. Like, I, I think that um, by the way that I do it with clients, because I've always thought, how do I deliver this value to clients? Like, it's so, you know... Um, Personal. Most social media companies will curate content from Google and po- repost shit. It's not, yeah. you know, like it's still an exposure, but it's not building their brand. So I actually sit down and interview my clients for 45 minutes and I ask them the questions which are likely to relate to their target audience. And, you know, not just like about their industry, but also about like things like, you know, human needs and like what's, what does life mean to you? What's success look like to you? Um, things that human beings can relate to, you know, you can chop it up. So each question and answer becomes one piece of micro content. So, you know, in 45 minutes of them being there, video team can create four months worth of content, you know, because like you don't want to be waking up in the morning going, oh, what should I post today? Then actually recording the video, you know, is that's a very inefficient way of doing it. Like it is extremely um, inefficient and so, like it doesn't really add value. So You've got to be patient for bigger picture stuff, but I think like you've got to be able to move quickly day to day. And the only way you can do that is if you plan your content effectively. During this 45-minute session where you ask your client questions, which question is most telling, most helpful to you? Um, so why did you start your business? Mm. Okay, and let's say from a, a younger age, I had a dream of letting anyone who wanted to start a company figure out how to reach their first 100 customers and make that dream a reality. Let's say, boom, there's a snippet. What can I do content-wise with that on LinkedIn? That's the short video right there. Like that's, tw- what, how long is that? 25 seconds? That's a short video. Yeah, I mean. The- so just take out the iPhone, record. Well, yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, you can do it like that. But like when, if you're recording, I would be recording longer form content and then cutting out the good bits. So you do it like an interview. If you are lucky enough to have the opportunity to speak from stage and you don't get it video recorded, that's just a huge waste because that, that content's so valuable. To be honest, I most of the time I do keynotes and videos and interviews and all that sort of stuff, mainly for the video content because I know that when I share it with my audience, like there's going to be, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 people that see it. I've never, ever spoken to over, I don't know, 400, 500 people at once in a room. <laughs> right, right. So it's, it's a, a lot of value in the video. And, and so like one keynote, again, could be 20, 30 videos very easily. So yeah, let's set up your phone, get a friend or get a um, you know, business partner or get a client to sit down with you and say, can you ask me some questions and find some questions in your industry that people are interested in. Either ask your customers or go on Quora. So Q-U-O-R-A.com. And like if you search a keyword like marketing, 
it will show you in order of what's most popular because people vote up questions or vote down questions what people want to know the answers to. And so you could just go through them one by one and each answer could be a, a video. Yeah, it's a great hack. Nathaniel, video has worked really well for yourself, but we may have listeners who are completely camera shy and would rather, you know, jump off a two-story building than <laughs> film themselves, <laughs> answer questions for the internet. Any advice for them? Yeah, like articles work really well. Like if, if, that's where you, if that's your jam, go for it. Like or even writing with a picture. Like when I started, I didn't do any videos of me. Or we couldn't do videos at the start, but I wasn't posting pictures of me. What I actually used to do is because I, was, I, I didn't consider myself successful or an expert when I was starting out posting content, but I was like, I was so interested in learning and learning from mentors and doing personal development. So a typical post from me would be, sharing a quote from Tony Robbins and going, I love this quote from Tony Robbins. It's so true. You know, I can relate to this in my exams when I, you know, thought I was going to fail and I passed, you know, what do you think? And so you're sharing in your perspective on, um, you know, and someone that's probably familiar, people familiar with Tony Robbins and more like read it. It's, it's still an effective strategy. I think building a personal brand is more effective, but you don't have to start like that at all. And do you always have a call to action in your posts? So you're always asking, what do you think? Or share your thoughts or ask a question in the comments? Like, how does that usually go? Yeah, look, I, I, I encourage it, but I don't always do it. No, I, I don't always do it. I test things all the time. So sometimes there's no reason behind why I don't do it. Sometimes I know that I can get engagement without asking for people to comment. It's based on, you know, like what emotions you can trigger you know, what story you're telling. Uh, you just learn after a while what's going to generate engagement, you know, without um, saying, hey, comment below. After a while, you, you sort of learn. But the main, when you've got a video, the main purpose of the caption is to just get them to press play. And then, you know, like on average, on social media, and this isn't just LinkedIn, this is a social media in general statistic, but on average, um, after 10 seconds, 50% of the people watching are gone. And after a minute, 80% of the people watching have gone. So get people to press play. And then the 10 seconds at the start has to be good enough for people to keep watching and so on. So, you know, like if you're doing a 10 minute video, it's got to be really good for people to watch the whole thing. Do you have a minimum number of posts to, to do per day or per week in order for that strategy to be effective or just literally from the first post? Bam. It's effective if you do it well. Yeah, like the, LinkedIn actually give you a bit of a push on your first post because they want to encourage new members to post. So that's always an incentive. But my clients will post three or four times a week, mm -hmm. uh, whereas I'm posting at least three or four times a day. Because the algorithm, when you look at it, like it's not sorted by recency, it's sorted by relevancy. So the content that's showing up at the top is, is what's most relevant. You know, time comes into it, but it's not the most important factor. So I would be focusing on quality and consistency, not so much like getting a high volume of stuff out there. You know, you're better off like backlogging and having enough content to be consistent through the times when you're not feeling very creative. What about the hashtags? Do you actually use a lot of that? Do you think it makes an impact or a difference? Yeah, look, I, I generally will not use more than three hashtags. It doesn't bring in a lot of extra eyeballs, but... Um, it's the only way to access a library of content on LinkedIn. So on Instagram, you go to somebody's profile, you see their library of content. But on LinkedIn, you just see their profile, right? Oh. So if you want to people to access your previous posts, develop your own hashtag, people can click on it or follow it, and they can see all of your content. So LinkedIn Heroes, the interviews which I do with entrepreneurs, um, if you click on that hashtag, you can see all of them. You know, they're all there. You, know, you can just go binge away, watch LinkedIn Heroes all weekend. <laughs> so one thing um, I want to interject on this one. Yeah. There was a story about hijacking hashtags. Let's say QuickMail, for example. Let's say, oh, that's cool. I'm going to create, you know, the hashtag QuickMail. Then someone actually starts using the hashtag QuickMail to say alternatives to QuickMail or, you know, that kind of crap. Yeah, yeah, actually yeah. fear about those hashtags hijacking or anything like that <laughs> yeah yeah i've had that i've had a few people like start oh, yeah? linkedin heroes i'm like <laughs> oh well <laughs> welcome to the party <laughs> oh, um right. so, I, I mean at the end of the day like it's relevancy so like the people in my network are more like they might see their content but if you you want to try and focus on getting the most engagement so therefore yours will be at the top makes sense you know i would never hijack someone else's hashtag purely because people are following it to receive their content, not mine. You know, I'm interrupting them if I do that. 
Nathaniel, personal question here. Being a well-known LinkedIn influencer, and I heard you mention that you're posting three to four times a day. I have some friends who are in like the the social media influencer space, and and they tell me that they are afraid to take a day off because they know that it's mm. really their job to keep their audience engaged, and without that, they lose a lot of self worth, maybe mentally or in reality. Given where you're at with uh, your audience and the success you've had with LinkedIn, are you afraid to take a day off? No, no, I'm not. Um, no, nah, no. Nah. I, I I enjoy it. Like I enjoy pushing it. I, we have targets every month for how many views, likes, and comments, and engagement we get. Last year, I took three months off, and I was a bit like concerned. I went on a three months sabbatical, and I was like, well, how am I going to be able to pick it up again? And you know, like it took some time, but I did. You know, and um, it, after a few weeks, we were um, you know getting engagement again, and um, yeah. So it, it's not the end of the world. And, and you've got to be careful about like managing your mental health as well. Like uh, if you start thinking that your self-worth is tied to people on behind a computer screen, you're in much bigger trouble than, you know, just generating engagement and making sales. Like that's a much bigger issue. Like you've got to make sure that um, you're doing it for others, not for yourself. Otherwise, you should better off not being on there. Well said. Thanks, man. I think at this stage, what I'd like to know really is this type of books that you found were really instrumental in your success, but also personal growth and help you, you know, along your career. Yeah, yeah great question. I read a lot of um, books. Like I think the Crush It by Gary Vee is a classic, yep. like for social media. Anybody using social media, Jordan Peterson, is it? The 12 Rules, to, 12 rules of Life, I think it is. I've read recently that that was good. Rules of something like that. George Jordan Peterson. I'll find. Yeah. Um, the One Thing by Brian Keller is very good. Yeah. Like, it's like the one thing, right? It's like, you know, you write your to-do list, you know, and then most people prioritize it and everything. He's like, well, look, just turn the page over and just write one thing. And you'll probably find that it's the most important thing, the thing you're uniquely good at, the thing that you generally just leave like and do quickly because you're so good at it. But it's it's quite important to to do what you're uniquely good at well. So take your time on it. And I found that if I'm getting really busy, I do that one thing strategy and I just focus on one thing for the day. I do it really well and everything else kind of starts to sort itself out. That's been a really good book. And uh, if you are struggling with the whole like self-worth thing, read The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Very good book by Mark good Manson. One. Yeah, I like it too. <laughs> it's a book that I've given out as a gift the most time. So it's a, I don't know if that's a bit of a... <laughs> Is that right? Love it. Okay, so a quick recap of like the highlights. Uh, there was a ton of takeaways, but basically the, here's the prescription. Fix up your LinkedIn profile so it reflects the needs of your target audience, right? Then start off by maybe 30 or 40 a day of LinkedIn requests to your second degree network of a very defined customer you want to go after. Start building this up. Take that conversation as quickly as you can to the phone if you're interested in like quick sales, making uh, you know that bottom line go up a bit. And next, there's a content game that's the more long term. You want to post maybe three or four times a week, find your medium, whether that's video or text with an image. You don't necessarily need to ask your audience to do something at the end of each post, but tell your story, be a part of your brand. And if you don't know where to start, you could write down why you started your business and turn that into a small post and go from there. Yeah. There's one other thing that I want to mention, because I'm just thinking about you know, the people that are out there and psychology of the whole thing. The relationship that you have with failure is really important. So I look at failure as something that I can learn from and, and so I don't look at it as a negative thing. I think it's a necessary part of the journey. And so like if you send 10 messages out and two people say, nah, I'm not interested, stop selling to me. It's not that it doesn't work. It's not that it doesn't work. It's just like you've learned that maybe something needs to change. Maybe it's one sentence, one word. But it's important to like make these mistakes, learn from them and keep going, not beating yourself up about it because it'll happen with content, it'll happen with your profile. You're never going to get everyone saying yes. You know, there's always going to be, a, it's going to be less than half. It's going to be, you know, maybe three in 10. But don't get caught up on the people that aren't interested. Don't waste your time there. Focus on the, the two or three people that are actually up for a conversation and spend your, your energy on those guys. Thanks for that. A lot of carryover in the cold email world. But uh, for right. now, Nathaniel, tell our listeners where they can get more from you. I mean, 
like just really there's, there's been so much that we've talked here, but I imagine we're just scratching the surface. So where do we go for more from you? Yeah, look, like obviously LinkedIn is a great place to get, you know, uh, daily content. YouTube is where I put all of my long form stuff and, and it ends up on my podcast channel and the Nathaniel Bibby podcast as well. Um, so if you ever want to do a deep dive and spend, you know, an hour really like diving into content about LinkedIn marketing, YouTube or the podcast is, is an awesome place to do it. Okay, great. Well, now you guys know the channels to get started. Nathaniel, what a treat to have you on the show, man. Really appreciate you coming on and, and schooling us on LinkedIn. Yeah, thank you, man. No, you're too kind, mate. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Hey, cold emailer. Yeah, you. If you got some value from this episode, give us a high vibe by sharing a two-sentence review on iTunes. Oh, Stitcher. Oh, tune in. That works too. It's a quick way to help other growth-minded folks like us find this podcast. So they can send awesome emails. And make everyone's inbox a better place. Thanks. <laughs>